You know, we had Renee Maskin on not long ago, who is uh, outside of, she's in the, in Asbury Park. And, uh, interestingly enough, uh, she is also, uh, was in a punk, uh, kind of emo band. Um, and now is more of a, a folk acoustic singer songwriter. Uh, is, is that what happens when you get older in New Jersey? You kind of transition over into the folk music. Oh, for me anyway, like I, my parents have a long driveway and they had a dumpster at the end of it. So I used to have to, before I could drive, I used to take my mom's car and take the dump, the garbage out. And she had like Johnny Cash CDs in there and all kinds of rant. She had all walks of life, but Johnny Cash kind of grabbed me. And then I heard him singing uh, Ring of Fire even before that in our shop. But And then one day I heard Social Distortion cover it, Mike Ness. And I was like, oh, wait, so he can do that. So maybe this stuff is kind of cool, you know, and. It kind of like because I was really into punk music then, but I was like, maybe there's something that came before this that's actually cooler than this and find out that story about it. So that was mine anyway. But Joe? Yeah, I mean, isn't that the progression? Like, you know, people like uh whether it's <laughs> someone from, you know, a punk band, like even going back to the clash and then him like discovering the folk world musics and working that into his Joe Strummer solo career later on with the Mescaleros, or whether it's someone like Brian Regan who, you know, you transform into a folk singer once you hit like 35 or 40, perhaps. But the bug hit us a little earlier, I guess. Um, like James was saying, there'd be a show and you'd have like a yeah. hardcore metal band, a straight edge, like DC hardcore band. And the next band would be like this emo group. The next band would be this like folk punk band from like, you know, somewhere like, you know, Boston or like Ohio or something. And then the next band would be totally different. And that just kind of melting pot just kind of made a lot of influences sort of mix up and kind of connect the dots. But for us, really, what happened was I was in a band in high school. And uh, when I went to college, I went to college in New York City and my band broke up. And at that time, a bunch of my friends from Jackson started to come visit me, uh, mainly because I lived in New York City, not because they really wanted to hang out with me. So they'd come up on Friday and leave on Monday morning, and sleep in my dorm all weekend. And we started playing songs in the parks, like Washington Square and Union Square. And, you know, we were always into people like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and Neil Young. And, you know, we always wondered, though, what was the music that they were into? Like, why did Neil Young make the music he made? Why did Bob Dylan make the music he made? Why did Johnny Cash record the music he made? And we quickly discovered music from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And that being one of the things that influenced a lot of those 60s artists. The other thing, of course, being R&B and soul music. But the other half of that piece was this like folk music from the 40s. So being in New York and playing in clubs and meeting people in Washington Square, we just kind of started picking up that tradition. And then one day we got invited to go up the Hudson River to this little town called Beacon. And it turned out that that's the town that Pete Seeger settled in. He was from New York City, but he settled up in Beacon. And uh, we got to meet him at this thing called the Hudson River Sloop Club Society. And they would have this monthly environmentalism meeting. And at the end of each meeting, there'd be this circle of song where anyone could just play. It's not an open mic. It's like controlled chaos, but it's a circle of people. And everyone down the line gets a chance to play a tune. And I'm sure you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, for the story's sake, we went up there and, uh, you know, we got to play these folk songs that we were learning at the time in front of like people who'd grown up with it for 40, 50 years. Uh, and Pete Seeger himself would be there sometimes. And that just changed our lives. So soon around then, James uh, stopped playing with our friend's band. We used to play shows together in different bands for years. And then when he became a free agent, our newly fledgling folk band said, hey, you want to play with us? And James actually taught himself how to play stand up bass to join our band. He'd been an electric bass player for years, but uh, he then started coming up to New York with us and we got to like Pete Seeger actually even, you know, stood up one time and sang with us, you know, which was like one of those moments that solidified that like doing what we do, which is a little bit of traditional folk music, but a lot of writing our own original folk songs, too, which is like what Pete's friend Woody Guthrie did was he didn't play a lot of traditionals. He played all originals, but is still one of those American folk singers. So we've kind of split it half and half and do a little bit of both. 